Hello, everyone. My name is Tammy Kim, and I'm a contributing opinion writer at The New York Times and a co-host of the Time to Say Goodbye podcast. On behalf of the publishing house Haymarket Books and Lannan Foundation, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's program with Professor Noam Chomsky on the consequences of capitalism. This event is part of Lannan Foundation's Readings and Conversations series, which is fully archived on YouTube and at lannan.org. Recently, Lannan and Haymarket have hosted discussions between Yanis Varoufakis and Daniel Denver, and Masha Gessen and Anand Ridderadas, and a wonderful panel on abolition with Angela Davis, Mike Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and Kienga Yamada Taylor. A big thank you to the good people of Haymarket and Lannan, especially Jordan Abel, Anthony Arnov, John McDonald, Sarah Knoop, Carrie O'Brien, and Jacopo Ramirez for organizing. In terms of our agenda today, I'll begin by introducing Noam, who will give a prepared talk for about 40 minutes. Then I'll ask Noam some questions and take audience questions as well. Please feel free to introduce yourself and say where you are in the chat box at the right hand side of your screen. And please write in your questions as we go. You will also see a link to order a copy of the wonderful book, Consequences of Capitalism, Manufacturing Discontent and Resistance. We'll wrap up today by 4.30 Mountain Time, so within 90 minutes. So, it is my great, great pleasure and luck to be in conversation today with Professor Noam Chomsky. Despite our far-flung locales, he is currently in Arizona and I'm here in New York. Noam is, of course, a speaker, activist, and scholar of linguistics without comparison, and therefore sort of impossible to introduce. But I suppose just saying his name is enough. Everyone knows who Noam Chomsky is, but what he means is different for everyone his work has touched. While preparing for this event, talking with friends and colleagues, I received kaleidoscopic advice. A community organizer said that she had never read Noam's books, but knew him as a fearless speaker and activist. A fellow reporter, most familiar with Noam's theory of distraction in the mass media, told me to ask about the book, Manufacturing Consent. And a friend in Korea said that he'd been memorably challenged by Noam's work on syntax in Korean translation during college linguistics class. I myself have been influenced greatly by Noam's work on the many US wars of the 20th and 21st centuries, especially in Asia. I am also moved constantly by Noam's personal example and moral leadership. He is someone who lives his convictions and believes that everyone, no matter our abilities, can and should do the same. When I read Noam's work on language, which I came to somewhat recently, I find myself paying new attention to the words I think and speak. The languages I know become fresh and lovely. It's similar to the feeling I have after watching a dance performance or a basketball game. I reconsider how my limbs move through space. For me, Noam has also been a guide to understanding and navigating our present crisis, our state of capitalism. And over these past few years of COVID deaths and joblessness, of record Amazon profits, of labor strikes and indigenous fights against global warming, of uprisings for black lives, of wars and a withdrawal from war, many more of us need the tools and historical perspective to understand what's going on. Today, Noam will give a wide-ranging talk based on the Haymarket book, Consequences of Capitalism, Manufacturing Discontent and Resistance. This book collects the lectures that Noam and his colleague Marv Waterstone have given in a course at the University of Arizona since 2017. In it, they pose many urgent questions. How does politics shape our world, our lives, and our perceptions? How much of the quote, of quote, common sense is actually driven by the needs and interests of the ruling class? And how can we challenge the capitalist structures that now threaten all life on the planet? Thank you so much for tuning in and considering these questions, questions along with us. It's my pleasure to now pass the microphone to Noam. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, to clarify, I won't be talking about capitalism as an abstract entity, but rather what actually exists 
And what actually exists is some form of state capitalism. In fact, that's all that's ever existed. The reason is that the capitalist system, if it were to exist, would very quickly self-destruct. And the business classes, those with power, uh, plainly don't want that. So they have always called on a powerful state uh, to be their instrument to the extent possible. Uh, the basic point, one of the basic elements was actually described simply enough by Adam Smith at the origins of the capitalist system. He was talking about, he described what he called the masters of mankind, which in his day were the merchants and manufacturers of England. And he said, the masters of mankind are the principal architects of government policy and they make sure that their own interests are most peculiarly attended to, no matter how grievous the impact on others, including the people of England, uh, but more, even more so, he said, the victims of uh, the savage injustice of the Europeans, speaking specifically of the English in India, whose crimes he bitterly condemned. Well, there's a lot of truth to that description. Of course, there's been a pushback. The people of England, other countries don't simply accept it. There's a balance between what the state does and what capital does and how that works out is crucial for modern history. Actually, we see it being played out in the halls of Congress today. Might get back to that if there's some time. Well, there's been variation over the years. There's periods of crisis. One was almost a century ago, 1930s, fascism developed in Europe. Fascism was a capitalist formation in which the state controlled capital and everything else, but did so making sure that the interests of capital were most peculiarly attended to in Smith's words. Today, it's different. We have, we're much closer to a period in which capital controls, but not always, and how it plays out is quite revealing, can tell us quite a lot about the socioeconomic and political order, how they work, the direction in which our own society is going. And that's actually a matter of deep concern in the world, in the most sober and respected circles. So take the world's leading business journal, Financial Times of London, its lead correspondent, highly respected correspondent, Martin Wolf, joined by his associates, uh, recently warned that US democracy is on the brink of complete collapse, turned to an autocracy, maybe quasi-fascist, under the blows of what he called a radical party with a reactionary agenda, actually a party which has abandoned normal parliamentary politics. These commentators are not alone. We hear much the same here from respected commentators. And given extraordinary US power, what happens here has immense consequences for the entire world. Well, we can gain some insight into this quite critical question by considering what seems to be a paradox. Paradox is that the state is effectively business run, but many of the policies are opposed by business. So that looks like a paradox. Take a few cases. Actually, the most 
long-standing case is the case of Cuba. Uh, immediately after the Castro took power in 1959, US planes started bombing Cuba from Florida bases. A couple of months later, Eisenhower administration internally, secretly, uh, made a decision to overthrow the government. Talk about what happened later. But Cuba has been under a severe sanctions ever since then. Sanctions so severe, they amount to a blockade. They're strongly opposed by the entire world. Latest vote at the United Nations a couple months ago was 184 to 2. The United States was joined by Israel, but that's reflexive. They're a client state, they have to join. So that's essentially unanimous opposition. Nevertheless, there's unan virtually unanimous adherence to the US sanctions. China doesn't adhere to them, a few others. Europe does strongly oppose them. Why? Because if they don't adhere to them, the United States can punish them severely. For example, it can throw them out of the international financial system, which is run from New York. Well, that tells us something about the world. It's basically kind of like the mafia. There's a godfather who decides, others obey. If they don't, they can be punished. Well, it's not very surprising that the United States rejects world opinion on Cuba, it does on many other issues as well. Pretty dramatic example was in the early 80s when Nicaragua brought a case to the world court uh, demanding, requesting appeal from the US war that was being waged against Nicaragua. Court voted in favor of Nicaragua, accused the United States of unlawful use of force, which is a technical term for international terrorism, ordered the United States to desist, pay huge reparations. Of course, the United States then came a Security Council resolution, which called on all states to observe international law didn't mention the United States, but everyone understood. The United States vetoed the resolution, dismissed the World Court judgment. New York Times editor supported that, saying the World Court is a hostile forum, as proven by the fact that they're condemning the United States. A couple of years earlier, the editors had regarded the World Court as a model of probity when it made a judgment in favor of the United States, but this of course changed it. Well, that's normal. More surprising in the case of Cuba is that the United States opposes central components of the business sector in the United States. Huge sectors, pharmaceutical corporations, energy corporations, agribusiness, they all want to enter the Cuban market, but the government says no, not allowed to. That's more unusual than dismissing world opinion. This is consistent from Eisenhower up to the present, very little deviation. The fiercest time was in fact under Kennedy major terrorist war against Cuba, almost led to global destruction as part of the background for the missile crisis, continued with others. Case of Clinton, he outflanked President, the first President Bush from the right in his effort to punish Cuba. Well, it's gone right to the moment, to the present moment. Let's take another case, Iran more serious in terms of its international consequences. 1953, as you know, the United States overthrew the uh, parliamentary government, installed, reinstalled the Shah, uh, 
uh, the part of the uh, the United States essentially replaced Britain, which had dominated Iran before then, and part of the U.S.-run coup was that U.S. energy corporations were to take 40% of the British concessions. The energy corporations opposed that. It was not good for their business interests. They could make much more profit lifting oil in Saudi Arabia. They didn't want to have to move over to Iran, but the government forced them to. Eisenhower, the Truman administration at that point, threatened them with serious antitrust uh, actions unless they accepted 40% of the British concession. Doesn't sound like a terrible punishment, but they didn't like it, but they accepted it. Uh, the uh, up to the present, Iran is, of course, under very severe sanctions. Uh, the uh, sanctions are really brutal. Uh, they are devastating for the population who are the target. It's gotten to the point where people are advertising their organs for sale to try to survive. It reaches to tiny details. So a couple of days ago, I gave an invited talk on philosophy to an Iranian audience. Iranian, Iran has high culture, advanced scholarship, lots of public interest, a huge audience. One problem, they couldn't use Zoom, they couldn't use Skype, because the United States will not permit any of the platforms to be used by Iranians. They had to find some devious way to record it and get it to an Iranian platform. Well, this is real savagery. And the world is opposed, but conforms. Europe conforms to the sanctions. US business is opposed. Uh, energy corporations, others would like to enter the Iranian market, but US government says no. Europe conforms for the same way it reason conforms to the Cuba blockade, punish, severe punishment if they don't. Obvious question is, why is this happening? Well, in the case of Cuba, we have internal documents, declassified internal documents, which explain it. Uh, the problem of Cuba, back to the 1960s, early 60s, is what the State Department called Cuba's successful defiance of US policies going back to the 1820s, the Monroe Doctrine, which declared US intention to control the hemisphere. We will not accept successful defiance. Other documents explain that if Cuba succeeds in this defiance, others might choose to follow the same direction U.S. domination of the hemisphere will erode, sometimes called the domino theory. It's ridiculed, but never abandoned because it's basically correct. U.S. didn't invent it. It goes back to much earlier imperial history. Well, what about Iran? Uh, 1953, there was part of the reason for the coup was also a version of the domino theory that was concerned that if Iran took control of its own resources, as it was trying to do, uh, it might have an effect elsewhere. Uh, there was conflict in the Middle East at the time, and Egypt were popular efforts in Egypt to try to throw out British domination, take control of their own resources. If Iran succeeded, it might succeed in Egypt can't take that risk. Well, that's, uh, of course, since 1979, the US has pretty much been at war with Iran. Uh, same, same thinking. Can't accept defiance. Can't, even worse, if it's potentially successful defiance, which others may be encouraged to follow. Well, there is a kind of a rational argument to support this. The state conflict 
with major business uh, interests, even though the state is business run. The idea is that the state essentially preserves long-term interests of capital, not parochial interests. CEO of a corporation wants to make profit tomorrow. The state authorities, who may be CEOs of corporations, but they're in a different institutional setting. And in that institutional setting, their concern is the long-term interests of the state capitalist system, which overrule the parochial interests of particular components of it, even major ones, like the huge sectors that I mentioned. It's a plausible argument, does not quite capture the sadism of the state actions, which is really quite remarkable when you look into it. Well, let's turn to a last case, a harder one, and a much more serious one, China. That's very serious. We're facing the risk of terminal war. That merits a close look. Well, under Trump, there was a trade war posed by US business. It's escalated under Biden. For the business world, it's something they don't like, threatens their investments, their market, their profits. They try to find around it, ways around it. It's justified by the argument that China is a major threat that you read everywhere. The interesting question is, what exactly is the threat? Chinese government does a lot of rotten things. Uh, others do too, including allies and clients. And as Trump said in one of those rare true, true statements that he managed to produce, so are we so innocent? So what is this? why is that a threat? Well, an answer was given by a distinguished international diplomat, prime, former Prime Minister of Australia, uh, Keating. Uh, he uh, described, and he's right in the in the claws of the dragon. Keating, Paul Keating, described the threat of China as follows. He said, somehow, the rise of 20% of humanity from abject poverty into something approaching a modern state is illegitimate. But more than that, by its mere presence and affront to the United States, it is not that China presents a threat to the United States. Rather, its mere presence represents a challenge to the United States preeminence. Well, that's successful defiance but it's not a small island overseas, offshore. It's a rising power and it will not be intimidated. So what's happening? Is the state taking over, dismissing private capital? Is it the mafia principle? Well, it's important to look. The United States is taking actions which are extremely dangerous. They're very little reported here, but they're dangerous. One of them is the recent so-called AUKUS deal, Australia, UK, United States. The United States is sending a fleet of advanced nuclear submarines to Australia, which is a severe threat to China. Uh, the military balance, of course, is overwhelmingly in favor of the United States. China has actually four old submarines, very noisy, even more noisy than submarines of the mid seventies. And the United States is now, and of course the United States overwhelmingly uh, dominates China in terms of weaponry right on its borders. It's surrounded by, it's off its east coast. There's, it's ringed with uh, American bases with nuclear armed missiles. China has no way its, its submarines can't do a thing, can't even get out of the South China Sea without being destroyed. But now we're increasing the, uh, extending the overwhelming 
domination, it's of course has no strategic purpose whatsoever. The subs aren't even going to go into operation for about 15 years. During that period, China will, of course, have expanded its military forces, its military power, so it can combat this new threat. So what happens is it raises the level of confrontation to a higher level. Uh, it, uh, and then we move closer to the kind of confrontation which might very well lead to terminal war. It's kind of interesting on the side that uh, China, uh, Australia had already made a deal with France for advanced non-nuclear submarines. The United States abrogated the deal. President Biden didn't even bother to inform France about it, read about it in the newspapers. Uh, they're telling France, essentially, you don't matter. Your vessels, European Union, you're subordinate to us. We don't even bother telling you more of the mafia principle. Europe doesn't like it. These are things to bear in mind. Well, let's turn more specifically to some of the consequences of state capitalism. Actually, it takes varied forms. Go back to the 1930s, the Depression. Most of Europe took the form of fascism. The United States took the form of social democracy, the New Deal. Europe followed the US model post-war. Certain irony to all of this for anyone who's lived through this period, as I have. The 30s, the United States was taking the lead in social democracy. Europe was moving to fascism. Now, almost reversed. Europe is maintaining social democratic principles under some attack. The United States is moving in directions which sober international opinions regards with some plausibility as quasi-fascist. Well, the, uh, going back to the United States in the 1930s, uh, business, the business world was quite opposed to the uh, New Deal measures, but they were enormously popular. There was powerful labor movement, sympathetic administration, not much they could do. Uh, during the war, things were put on hold Post-war, the business offensive took off, very powerful offensive, counter-offensive, but there was too much public opposition. Um, go back to President Eisenhower, the last conservative president. He, his position, as he was explicit, is that anyone who opposes New Deal measures does not even belong in the political system. Anyone who questions the right of workers to organize in unions is just not part of our political system. That's Eisenhower in the 1950s. Uh, the system that was instituted is sometimes called regimented capitalism, controlled effectively by state power, very high tax, extremely high taxation for the very rich in the corporate sector. Uh, the uh, no no, no escape. Treasury Department was very uh, vigorous in prosecuting any efforts to evade the system. It was the greatest growth period of American history. Economists often call it the golden age of capitalism and egalitarian growth. The lowest quintile did as well as the highest quintile. Uh, there were plenty of flaws. But uh, as far as the business, as far as the economic system was concerned, it was a successful system. Well, by the mid 70s, the business offensive mounted. By the late 70s, we moved, there was a transition to a new system, what's called neoliberalism, took off under Reagan and Thatcher. We've been living with that for the last 45 years. So what's neoliberalism? Well, look it up on the internet to get a definition. I'll read it. A political approach 
that favors free market capitalism deregulation and reduction in government spending that's the definition take a look at practice almost the opposite government spending increases there's no free market capitalism uh, the one accurate part is deregulation in practice if you look at it the right name for neoliberalism is one-sided class war the masters of mankind against the rest adam smith's term and that was very clear from the outset in 1978 douglas fraser head of the united auto workers pulled out of a labor management conference that carter was running and i'll quote him he expressed his shock that business leaders had chosen to wage a one-sided class war in this country a war against working people the unemployed the poor the minorities the very young and the very old and even many in the middle class of our society they have broken and discarded the fragile unwritten compact previously existing during a period of growth and progress during the period of um, adding this class collaboration under regimented capitalism well his understanding was somewhat belated businesses always fighting a class war sometimes with less opposition in which it becomes more one-sided well it was perfectly obvious what was going to happen from the very start just take a look at reagan's uh, inaugural address government is the problem not the solution so decisions have to be taken away from government which is somewhat under popular influence and vested in some other institutions where private uh, capital, obviously. Decisions move from government to private capital, which is totally unaccountable to the public. The economic guru of the administration, Milton Friedman, came along and explained what the role of private capital is. Private corporations, he says, have one responsibility to maximize profit, period. And of course, management and uh, salaries and so on. Now, the right to incorporate is actually a gift from the public, it carries many advantages. If you don't want the gift, you can stay a partnership. But once you receive the gift, According to this doctrine, you have no responsibilities. So what's happening? Decisions are being shifted from government, partially accountable, responsive to the public, to private concentrations of power, which have no response, no commitment to the public, unaccountable, or purely uh, in the interest of maximizing their own profit. So what do you expect to happen? Well, we actually, doesn't take a genius to figure it out. We actually have a measure of what happened. A couple months ago, the Rand Corporation, uh, ultra respectable, uh, did a study to try to estimate the amount of wealth, wealth that was transferred from the middle class and the working class uh, during the last 45 years of neoliberalism that's the lower 90% of the population, how much wealth was taken from them to the very top, if you look closely to 1%, even a fraction of 1%. Their estimate is close to $50 trillion. Uh, that's an underestimate. Doesn't include lots of other things that were opened up for the rich and the powerful once Reagan opened the spigots tax havens, another tens of trillions of dollars, constant bailouts. We moved to a bailout economy, economy deregulation, especially the financial industries, of course, led to crashes. So you get each one worse than the last. When there's a crash, 
government comes along and the friendly taxpayer bails you out very selectively. So take Obama, the last major crash. There was a major bailout bill, TARP, had two parts. One, to bail out the perpetrators of the crisis, the banks which were making predatory loans and so on, have to bail them out, the big insurance companies. The other part of the legislation was compensation for the victims, people who lost their homes uh, because of foreclosure and so on. Well, if you know the way a state capitalism, capitalist system operates, you can predict which part of the, of the legislation was carried out the obvious one. Inspector General of the Treasury Department was so outraged. Neil Borofsky wrote articles and books about it, but that's the way it works. You bail out the rich and the powerful, the rest hang on the vine. That's Obama. Uh, no stone is left unturned. The uh, One of the major business organizations American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, supported by all the major corporations, has a very clever strategy. They work at the state level. It's pretty easy to pressure states. Doesn't take much money to win the state election. So they get the force trying to compel, they write legislation for the states, which make it business friendly. No stone is left unturned. So one of their major projects has to do with wage theft. Turns out that huge amounts of money, billions of dollars, are stolen from poor working people just by not paying the wages. Well, you could look into that, but Alec wants to stop it. So they're imposing legislation at the state level, which bans any punishment for wage theft, even any investigation of it. As I say, in one-sided class war, no stain, no stone is left unturned. Under Trump, this just became a parody. You can barely laugh at it if it wasn't so serious. There was one legislative achievement under Trump, the tax bill of 2017, which was a joke. It was a giveaway to the very rich in the corporate sector stabbing everyone else in the back. One consequence of it is that for the first time in a century, the billionaires pay a lower tax rate than steel workers. You take a look at the current Republican organization, I hate to call it a party. They've, in the current debates in Congress, they've established a red line, several red lines. One of them is you can't touch the Trump tax scam. That's sacrosanct. Another is you can't fund the Internal Revenue Service, because if you did, they would look into robbery by the rich. So that's a red line. You can make various kinds of deals, but you can't touch that. Well, the point is, markets are for the weak and the vulnerable. The masters want a powerful state that intervenes radically in markets for their benefit in one-sided class war. Pretty much what Adam Smith described. Well, if you're going to launch a one-sided class war, it's very important to eliminate any defense that the population might have. If you look back 40 years, the first acts that were taken by Reagan and Thatcher were to attack and destroy the unions the main means of defense of people against a one-sided class war. They resorted to technically illegal means, scabs, permanent replacement workers. Now that opened the door to private corporations who could then follow the same, the same policies. I see we should bear in mind that this is standard neoliberal doctrine. Go back to its origins in Vienna 19, in the 1920s. That's where the neoliberal movement began. The guru, the leading figure of the movement up until today is 
Ludwig von Mises. Uh, he, in 1928, the semi-fascist Austrian state smat, destroyed the labor movement in a violent repression. Uh, von Mises was overjoyed. They were contributing to sound economics. Labor unions are a threat. They try to support the rights of working people. That interferes with sound economics. Uh, von Mises said this is, was quite open about it. He wrote about fascism. Fascism was then Mussolini. had destroyed the labor movement, independent thought, uh, imposed a brutal, harsh regime. He said that, fa and, he, and he had, von Mises had a major book called Liberalism, meaning neoliberalism. And he said that fascism and similar movements on the right, aiming at establishment of dictatorships, are full of the best intentions. And their intervention has, for the moment, saved European civilization. The merit that fascism has thereby won for itself will live on eternally in history. That's fascism. Next step, Pinochet dictatorship in Chile, our, which we basically instituted, vicious dictatorship, imposed murderous regime. The neoliberals loved it. Chicago economists flocked to Chile to run the economy. Uh, Friedrich Hayek, the more humane of the neoliberal leaders, was overjoyed. He said, he visited Chile. He said, everyone agreed that they had much more freedom under the Pinochet dictatorship than under the Allende social democratic regime. Well, that was the 70s. By then they were on to bigger game namely the world, beginning with Carter, but taking off with Thatcher and uh, uh, Reagan. Well, it's bipartisan. The Republicans have been in the lead, the Democrats go along. So take what's called globalization, neoliberal globalization. How does it work? A group of rich bankers in New York get together, decide they can make more profit if they close down a factory in Indiana and send it across the border to Mexico. So they do it. Well, there's a justification given for this by moral philosophers and economists, some of them at least. They say, well, look, uh, people in Mexico need jobs too. So we're doing good. Slight problem. What this means is that U.S. workers are providing charity for people in Mexico. How about something different? How about if the rich bankers in New York provided the charity to Mexican workers, like by raising wages and living standards, leveling the playing field? That's unthinkable. That's not sound economics under capitalist morality. It's the workers who have to pay. Well, uh, this goes on. It's neoliberal globalization is a multiple attack on labor. First of all, you lose your jobs because you have to provide charity to the workers in the third world. And also unions are under attack. Take NAFTA, Clinton's initiative strongly opposed by the labor movement. Uh, it was a major attack on labor. Attacks organize, about 50% of organizing efforts in the post-NAFTA period were broken up by uh, techniques like a big sign on the workplace saying, transfer job to Mexico. In other words, if you try to organize a union, we'll just take off to Mexico. It's illegal, but it doesn't matter if there's a criminal state. You can be as illegal as you like. Well, the NAFTA and others are called free trade agreements. Interesting phrase. 
first of all, they're not agreements, at least if people are part of the country. Population was opposed actually in all three countries. Is it trade? It's not trade. Large part of the trade, we don't have corporate records, but estimates are maybe 50%, is internal to firms. So some major corporation makes parts in Indiana, sends them to Mexico to be assembled, sells it in California. Well, that's called trade in both directions. It's not trade. It's, no tra it's internal to a command economy. It's as if in the old Soviet Union, the parts were made uh, somewhere in the Urals, sent to Poland for assembly and sold in Leningrad. We didn't call that trade. Cross borders, it's not trade. A very large part of the so-called trade internationally, probably the majority. Uh, is it free? It's not free. The agree so-called agreements are highly protectionist. They give unprecedented patent rights that never was anything like that, both for the product and the process to major corporations. That's monopoly rights to corporations, a big cost to the population. That's why drug prices are in the stratosphere, others. Uh, if uh, Microsoft didn't have monopoly pricing rights, Bill Gates would be working for a living. Well, this is coming to be a major problem right now with the pandemic. Uh, big issue on the front pages. I don't have to go into it. Moderna, for example, says can't give away its, its process patents. Uh, Moderna's made a real killing on the uh, on the vaccine, they contributed something, mainly government spending. The basic technology discoveries were in government labs. Government has greatly subsidized it, but Moderna executives are now getting into the Forbes 400 of top earners. That's an aspect of the way the whole economy works. Take what we're using now, computers, internet, satellites, where'd that come from? Well, 50s and 60s, it was coming out of research in government labs, research universities, like the one where I was, MIT, developing the high tech of the future. Business learned how to do it, then they market it. It's not too much of an exaggeration that we, to say that we live in a system of public subsidy, private profit. Well, no time to run through the details. The effects of these 45 years have been devastating everywhere, except for the masters. They're going through the roof. Uh, the top 1% of well, the population in the United States doubled their wealth from 10% of total wealth to 20%. You look closely, it's a fraction of 1%. Uh, CEO salaries have gone through the roof. Uh, the ratio of CEO to worker salaries has multiplied by a factor of 10 over these years of highway robbery, one-sided class war. So for the masters, it's great. Well, there are reactions. Uh, millions of workers right now in the United States are simply refusing to go back to work under the rotten conditions created by the neoliberal assault, the one-sided class war of the last 40 years. So almost entirely non-unionized workers, thanks to the decimation of unions. This withholding of labor should be called the great strike of 2021 it's the phrase by left economist Jack Rasmus. It's a major strike, withholding of labor, many millions of people, lots of discussion in the, the press by economists. The reason's perfectly obvious. They don't want to go back to the rotten conditions that have been imposed in one-sided class war. There's also been a wave of actual strikes. 
teachers in the red states, Arizona, where I am, West Virginia, fighting back against the destruction of public education, which has been very conscious, very explicit through the past 40 years. People are resisting in other ways. The global climate strike a couple of weeks ago, mostly young people struggling to save us from our suicidal impulses. Well, is that going to be enough to reverse the liberal assault? We don't know. That's for us to determine. Well, let me just make a final comment. There are deeper issues with capitalism well beyond the destructive character of the savage capitalism of the last 45 years. Just think for a moment about what's the aspiration for a young person. Get a job. Let me get a job. That is, let me spend almost all of my waking hours in service to a master. Service that's beyond totalitarian. Stalin couldn't tell people at 3 p.m. you have five minutes when you can go to a restroom. Uh, if you're a UPS driver, you're monitored constantly. Stop for a cup of coffee when you weren't supposed to. Get a demerit. A couple of those, you lose your job. You're an Amazon work uh, workplace. There's a particular path that's been figured out to get from here to there. If you stop to say hello to a friend, you get an immediate message saying you're in trouble. Too many of those, you're out. Well, uh, this kind of subordination to a master hasn't always been accepted. In fact, for two millennia, the, it was assumed that the worst attack on human rights and dignity is servility to a master. The 19th century, that was the attitude of the workforce. Uh, the uh, radical farmers in the Midwest, Texas, uh, Kansas, uh, organized to try to free themselves from the control of Northeastern bankers and market managers. They wanted to form a cooperative commonwealth where they would control their own affairs. Meanwhile, the labor movement was developing, Knights of Labor, huge labor movement. Its motto was, those who work in the mills should own them. We don't want capitalist masters stealing our labor. They almost got together. If they had, this would be a very different country, far more democratic crushed by force. Uh, well, rose again in the 1930s. It's been attacked ever since. It's not the end. It's time to get to work. We face crises that are urgent. There are deeper issues in the background. Challenges can be met. It's not going to be easy. And there's not much time. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments, Noam. Maybe I'll start at the top of your talk um, in your international section. Um, I was curious, um, you know, there's been, I think, a lot of increased scrutiny of our so-called forever wars or our endless wars of aggression. But what you outlined um, in terms of our processes in client states is something different. We're still exerting our force as the U.S. in various ways, even if we aren't specifically intervening in a military fashion. Um, how do you think we can exert more scrutiny over those processes as opposed to just looking at, you know, wars? So are you asking about military intervention versus other kinds of intervention. Yeah, I think there I think at this point there is a growing consensus that we should not be staging military, military interventions, but neocolonialism, yeah. clientelism, various forms of other intervention continue. Yeah. Well, there is an no interesting notion called forever wars. We shouldn't have forever wars. Now, stop to think about it for a moment. When did our forever wars begin? Well, actually in 1783, 
soon as the British yoke was overthrown, the colonists immediately invaded the West. The British had prevented that. It's one of the reasons for the Revolutionary War, invaded the Indian nations through the 19th century wars of extermination, destruction, conquered half of Mexico. After that come interventions all over the world. It's hard to find a year in US history when we haven't been at war, usually aggressive war. Well, take the so-called forever wars. They started with uh, George W. Bush uh, after 9-11. There was no, there was no justification for the invasion of Afghanistan. In fact, the United States didn't even care about Al Qaeda and bin Laden. That was made quite clear. Uh, shortly after the invasion, Taliban agreed to surrender, which of course would have meant handing them over. Uh, the answer by Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld was, we do not negotiate surrenders. He was backed by the president, said, we're not interested in surrenders. What were they interested in? Well, I think the answer, the only answer I've ever seen was given, good answer was given by the leading figure in the Afghan anti-Taliban resistance, Abdul Haq. He was at, he had an interview in Europe um, by a leading Central Asia specialist, Anatoly Yevin, asked it, why are the Americans invading? He said, the Americans are going to kill a lot of Afghans. They're going to undermine our efforts to overthrow the Taliban from within, which are promising, but they don't care. They want to show their muscle and intimidate everyone. That's why they're invading. Well, they did show their muscle and intimidate everyone. Then they went on to the real prize, invading Iraq. The intention was to go way beyond. You recall this was made quite public. Well, these things turned into a fiasco for the United States, so they couldn't go way beyond. And they had to turn to other means. Well, those are the so-called forever wars. I don't think they're even a blip in the history of American imperialism. Just take a look at China. Right now, escalating, escalating a very dangerous war against it. This time, a major power, which is carrying out successful defiance and uh, uh, might have a domino effect. Now it's, we're getting into really serious territory, invading it. Iraq and Afghanistan caused a disaster for the populations, didn't lead to terminal war. This might. You up the ante with China, they're going to respond. Send nuclear submarines to Australia, they'll build up their defenses. They'll respond by sending planes to buzz Taiwanese air defenses. Who knows what's going to come out of that? So this is, it's the same policies, same motivations. We have to intimidate the world, show our muscle, make sure everybody follows our orders, whether it's a blockade of Cuba, a brutal murder sanctions against Iran, whatever it may be, we continue with them because we have to rule the world. Even if we have to tell Europe, get lost, you follow us. I don't think the end of the so-called forever wars is, has much of a detectable effect. Thank you. Picking up on your analysis of China, I'm curious how you would respond to many leftists who are feeling very challenged about what seems to be a false choice in our discourse. Support the US or support China? With it, I didn't get Oh, sorry. It. Let me repeat it for you. Um, I'm curious how you would respond to many leftists who are struggling with how to understand the Chinese situation right now. Um, and I'll just rehearse the, the sort of choice that's posed, which is often, you know, if you, if you are against U.S. empire, you must essentially 
you know, embrace Chinese empire. There's a bit of a false choice in the discourse. How would you respond to that? How do you see that? There is a Chinese empire. It's, first of all, China's doing, it, most of the Chinese empire, the overwhelming majority of it is what's called soft power. So China's expanding into Central Asia. Shanghai Cooperation Organization, based on China, has been integrating the Central Asian states into the Chinese dominated system that the organization now includes India, Pakistan, Russia, all the Central Asian states, Kazakhstan and the others, Iran's brought into it. Turkey might come in pretty soon, entry to Europe. This is the Belt and Road Initiative, major development initiative. China's not doing it out of altruism. They're extending their power over much of Central Asia, which traditional geostrategic analysts like Mackinder called the center of world power, doing the same in Africa, building railroads, uh, uh, trade relations, even Latin America, the US backyard, uh, they're the leading trading partner for uh, South America. The US doesn't like it, it's been trying to block it. Uh, they're trying COVID diplomacy, sending vaccines and so on. They're also doing some things which are strictly illegal. Like in the South China Sea, China has ignored a judgment of the International Court of Justice. Well, that's a problem. Uh, the US is not in a very strong position to object to that. For one thing, the United States is the only maritime power which hasn't even ratified the law of the sea, which is what is at stake. Well, this is an obvious place for diplomacy and negotiations. Now, that's even more true over what's called the freedom of navigation issue. You read the press, we're told the United States is defending freedom of navigation in the when it sends a naval armada uh, into the South China Sea. That's not accurate. There is no question of freedom of navigation that has never arisen. The truth of the matter is described accurately by Australian strategic analysts, the ones who are right there. What's at issue is an ambiguous element in the law of the sea concerning what are called exclusive economic zones. According to the law of the sea, Every state, United States, China, others, has a 200 mile exclusive economic zone offshore. And there's a technical question about what f activities are permitted by foreign powers in that zone. Are you permitted to have military and intelligence activities? The wording of the law of the sea is kind of ambiguous. It says there can be no threat or use of force. So the technical question is, are military activities the threat or use of force? Well, China says yes. The United States says no. China is supported by India. India recently vigorously opposed US military actions in its economic exclusive zone. So there's a debate over a technical issue, obvious case for diplomacy and negotiations, not a show of force, not sending a naval armada, not sending a fleet of nuclear submarines. Uh, that's not the answer. The relation, China and the United States simply have to cooperate. I mean, the major crises we face, they don't have any borders. There's no borders to the pandemic, no borders to global warming, not even for nuclear war because it's everywhere once there's a major one. Uh, none of the problems are bounded by borders. Well, here are the two major powers, huge superpower, the United States, overwhelmingly dominant, a rising superpower, which is growing. They have to cooperate. If they don't, we're simply finished. 
It's not a choice. So the question is how to move towards cooperation rather than confrontation. That shouldn't be beyond the means of the leadership. Certainly the populations of the world should be pressing very hard for them to move in this direction. What is at stake? And one quick follow up to that. Um, does your analysis extend to Taiwan, Hong Kong and Xinjiang? Obviously, a lot of people around the world are concerned about what they've been seeing there. They should be. What China's doing in Hong Kong is unconscionable. I mean, Hong Kong was a British colony, had no freedom at all. But when the British left and handed it over to China, the idea was that it should be free and democratic for the first time. Actually, Hong Kong was stolen from China by British gunboats uh, as part of their huge narco trafficking trade to try to break into China. But recently, when the British finally left, in theory, it was supposed to have freedom and democracy. And to a significant extent, it did. Well, China is now cutting back on that. It's imposing more restrictions. We should strongly support the people of Hong Kong and their opposition to this. But as uh, President Trump said, so are we so innocent? There's plenty of things like this all over the world, including much worse things than we've done and are doing. So yes, we should care about it. It's not a threat to us, but it's something that we should be upset about. Well, let's say Taiwan. The, there is an official policy in which the U.S. adheres to. It's called the One China Policy. It says, in principle, Taiwan is part of China, but only in principle. In practice, it should be independent. That was 1979, I think. It's worked pretty well since then. Just a tacit agreement. Yes, you have it the right in principle, but you're not going to implement it. Now, that's worked pretty well. As the provocations are rising, mostly from us, China's reacting. So a couple of days ago, there was an overflight of Taiwan by Chinese bombers. That's a signal that says, don't push the provocations too how far. You push them too far, we're here. We don't get intimidated. We're not Europe. We don't get intimidated by you, so we'll react. Well, we can push the provocations higher. They'll push them fry higher. Pretty soon we'll go to war. We're all done. Okay. Or we can try to move back to diplomacy, negotiations, cutting back provocations, protesting things that deserve to be protested, pressuring where we can by diplomatic means, but working towards cooperation. There is simply no alternative. China doesn't call it a threat to them when we are taking part in the devastating crushing of two million people in the Gaza Strip, including a million children who are now at a point where they literally do not have water. Under the 97% of the water is undrinkable. The children are being sacrificed, a million children. We're doing it. We're providing the weapons and the diplomatic support. Well, China has no right to respond militarily to that. They don't even protest, but they could. It's a horrible crime, but it's not a threat to them. These are crimes that we have to deal with. It's our crime. China's crimes, China's going to have to deal with. Thank you for that. I'm glad you brought up Israel and Palestine um, because I was recently reading your book, The Fateful Triangle, and conditions have substantially worsened for Palestinians since that time. Um, but I heard you recently speak about some optimism you feel around 
the United States people's suspicions of Israel, their growing condemnation of what's happening there. Do you currently see openings for movement work or policy changes that could help liberate the people of Palestine? I think the solution to the Arab Israel, Palestinian, the Palestinian Israel confrontation is going to have to come in the United States. Uh, Israel has followed a policy since Israel made a decision in the 1970s, fateful decision. They had the choice of a political settlement. It was quite explicit. In fact, there was a Security Council resolution in January 1976, uh, supported by the major Arab states, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, uh, tacitly supported by the PLO, not openly. Uh, it called for a political settlement on the internationally recognized border, maybe some modifications. Uh, the phrase was mutual minor modifications. Uh, a settlement with two states, Israel, Palestine, with guarantees for the right of, I'm quoting it now, the right of each state to exist in peace and security within secure and recognized borders. Israel was infuriated. They refused even to attend the session. Prime Minister Rabin said, we will never negotiate with Palestinians on anything. The United States vetoed the resolution. Well, there's a long diplomatic history after that, but it's pretty much the same. Uh, during this period, Israel has, they, they made a decision at that time, choose expansion over security. Well, that choice meant reliance on the United States because it was certain, you could see right away, they're gonna become a pariah state. You, the world is not forever gonna accept this. As you defy Security Council resolutions over and over on Jerusalem, on the Golan Heights, uh, defy international law, world court decision, uh, pretty soon the world isn't gonna like it, plus all the atrocities major atrocities in Gaza, constant atrocities in the West Bank. You read the Israeli press every day, there's some new atrocity. Well, the world's turning against it. They rely entirely on the US. If the US puts it, and the US supports it, it's a, provides overwhelming aid. In fact, when Israel runs out of arms in one of its attacks on Gaza, as it recently did, simply turns to the United States to replenish them. Often the US can replenish them right from within Israel because the US stocks arms in Israel, it's a client state, stocks arms there for US use if it ever needs them. They did that during one of the protective edge, one of the main attacks. Well, what about US support for Israel? It's fragile, very fragile. Uh, if you go back a few years, Israel was the darling of liberal opinion, not very far back. That's finished. Among more liberal sectors, there's, it's kind of as much support for the Palestinians. That's particularly true among younger people, including younger Jews, incidentally, far more support for Palestinians. Uh, Support for Israel has drifted to the far right. It's in the evangelical community. It's connected with their various ideas about the second coming and so on. And uh, military and security sectors, they're very supportive of Israel, close relations. And the ultranationalist elements and anti-Muslim elements. That's a big shift and it's fragile. And it's more than that. Take Israel's nuclear weapons. You probably read in the New York Times a couple of months ago, there was an editorial, which surprised me. There was an editorial pointing out the obvious solution 
to the alleged threat of Iranian nuclear weapons. I and others have been screaming about it for years, so it's glad to see it in print. There's an obvious solution, impose a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. They're all over the world, so let's do it in the Middle East. Intensive inspections, we know they work. They worked very well under the joint agreement, US intelligence agrees, and the Iranian threat, whatever it's supposed to be. No more sanctions, nothing, it's all finished. Well, the Times had actually had an editorial advocating that with a footnote. Israel's nuclear weapons are non-negotiable. Okay, so the one nuclear weapon state in the Middle East can't be touched. In fact, the United States does not officially recognize that Israel has nuclear weapons. Of course, everyone knows they do, it's a huge arsenal, but you can't officially recognize it for a good reason. If you do that, American law comes into play. American law, Symington Amendment, others has provisions which seriously question whether a, any aid to Israel is even legal under American law, given that it's constructed a nuclear weapons arsenal outside the framework of the non-proliferation agreement. Well, you could get our lawyers arguing it on both sides, but nobody wants to open that door. So the United States consistently vetoes the solution to the alleged problem of Iranian nuclear weapons. The latest was Obama, came up in 2015, whole world in favor of it, Arab states all in favor, Iran is strongly in favor of it, the G77, Global South, strongly in favor of it, Europe's in favor of it, US won't allow it, because it would mean recognizing Israel's nuclear weapons. Well, I think myself that the American population would not be terribly happy if they learned that we're facing a allegedly a severe threat in Iran and it could blow up because we have to protect our aid, massive aid to Israel from American law. I think that's worth getting people to understand. It's almost undiscussable in the United States almost undiscussable. Love, there are people who talk about it a lot. You talk to an audience, they understand it, but can't make it to the mainstream. Very interesting example of uh, thought control in a free society. There are other such examples. In fact, the case of the China threat is one of them. Try to ask, what is the China threat? I don't know any better answer than Paul Keating's. What is the Iranian threat? What's exactly the threat of, I mean, suppose Iran were to develop a nuclear weapon. What's the threat? I mean, if Iran even loaded it on a missile, the country would be vaporized. I mean, the ruling clerics could be horrible people. They're not totally suicidal. I mean, all of these things are severely misconstrued. Thank you. In our remaining time together, I wanted to fold in a couple of audience questions. We have one about academic freedom from a professor named David who wants to know if your view of the role of intellectuals or academics has changed or what your views are right now in light of the many attacks on academic freedom and shrinking departments. Tax on academic freedom have been going on all my life. In the post Second World War period, they were very severe. Now, that's why you, you couldn't find, say, a Marxist economist in the United States, uh, everywhere in the world. You have them in economics department, can't be here. Uh, the United States is pretty much off the international spectrum on this. I mean, even the word socialist is considered an inflammatory term in the United States. You can't have a 
till very recently, you couldn't have a college professor saying I'm a socialist. Everywhere else in the world except tyrannies, it's just like saying I'm a Democrat. It's nothing. The communists run for office, communists are in faculties. None of that is thinkable in the United States. I mean, just from my own experience alone, I could regale you for a long time on what happens in the universities if you try to talk about something that's not acceptable. Up until pretty recently, I had to have police protection, even in my own university, MIT, if I was talking about Israel and Palestine. Uh, people have been thrown out and so on. So cancel cultures all over the place. What's new and wrong is that segments of young people on the left are picking up the practices that have been commonly used and are trying to keep people off campus who they don't like and so on. And that's happening. Wrong in principle, tactically suicidal. It's a gift to the far right. They love it. Uh, Trump ran his campaign on it. Uh, it, it, it strengthens the, say, somebody's trying to come to campus, you keep them off, you're giving them a gift. They can then present themselves as heroes defending free speech from the totalitarian left. It's beautiful. You want to treat it sanely. Let, if they're invited to campus, let them come, set up a counter meeting, discuss their views and attitudes and educational experience. Half the time you find they won't even want to come if you're going to do that. But that's the sensible way to deal with it. If you want to stab yourself in the back, keep them off campus. And wrong. So yes, it exists. It's now a huge issue because it's directed not against the left, which is normal and acceptable, but it's directed against mainstream and right-wing people. That's out. And it should be out. That should be protested. But we should recognize where it sits in the general picture. Thank you. One last question from Georgia in the audience, who is curious about how you see the current labor movement in the United States. Um, Georgia cites, for instance, um, the ongoing um, contract um, process at John Deere as an example of places where rank and file rebellion is underway, where organizing is happening. Are we in a moment of resurgence in the U.S. labor movement? That's a very crucial question. If you look back over history, the labor movement has been typically in the forefront of uh, constructive social change. I mean, I mentioned the 1930s. The reason, the main force behind the New Deal was militant labor activism. I'm old enough to remember this very well. The labor movement had been virtually crushed in the 1920s, mainly by Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare. U.S. has a very violent labor history, much more so than Europe. But the labor movement was almost dead in the 20s. Revived in the early 30s, started moving on to serious organizing, CIO organizing, militant labor actions like sit-down strikes. Sit-down strike is very frightening to the master class. Sit-down strike is one step before saying, we can run this place ourselves. We don't, we don't eat bosses. It's not far from that. That's the ultimate weapon. At that point, business relaxed its strenuous opposition to New Deal measures. Supreme Court has succeeded when there was some sympathy in the government. If the government can call in massive force, like the National Guard and so on, then you're not going to get anywhere. But in the cases where there's some sympathy administration, labor action can make a big difference. It did basically create the New Deal, which has been very beneficial to Americans up to the present. It's been seriously eroded, as I mentioned, up to Eisenhower was taken for granted that you can't even question it. 
Since then, it's been under severe attack during the neoliberal period, seriously eroded. So can we revive, can the labor movement revive today? Well, I think so. In fact, one thing that I mentioned was what Jack Rasmus calls the great strike of 2021, the refusal of workers to go to work. That's basically what a strike is. We're not going to work. You've imposed such rotten, miserable conditions that we're just not going to work for you. Okay. Millions of people. It's very it's not organized. It's just individuals deciding. There's no organization. Not in the unions, mostly non-unionized. That could be a force that could go somewhere. And there are major strikes, like take the teacher strike. I'm in Arizona, which is you know, not a liberal state, but it had enormous support. Drive around town, there are signs on people's lawns everywhere supporting the teachers. They were not just calling for higher wages, which they badly need. They're very badly paid. They were calling for better educational opportunities for children. Don't force us to teach in a classroom with 50 kids. But don't take away the special programs, arts programs. Don't take away the nurses, you know. Put a decent educational environment in place. Remember, we've just had a secretary of education for the past four years who wanted to destroy the public education system. Not hidden. Go back to Milton Friedman, the guru of the neoliberal period. He was strongly opposed to public education on principle. He even worked together with the segregationist schools in the 1970s who were trying to find ways out of you know, the legal requirements about segregation by pretending to be religious or something else. Milton Friedman was working with them, anything to destroy public education. It's, kind of, it's this understandable. It fits with the neoliberal idea back to Vienna in the 20s. She can't interfere with sound economics, what they call sound economics, which is, don't talk about what it is, but that's the principle. Uh, the, uh, uh, so the teacher strikes have been very effective. There have been nurses strikes, service strikes. There was a major General Motors strike. Uh, I think you're seeing signs of revival of the labor movement. And it's extremely important. If I don't think there's much chance for pushing through the kinds of limited, mild social democratic measures that the so-called progressive Democrats are pressing for, unless there's going to be strong labor backing. Thank you so much for that. And a bit of a hopeful note to end on. To that. Oh. The Republicans have pulled a, a good, an interesting trick on this. The Republicans now present themselves as the party of labor. And it's very interesting because they are the most anti-labor party mm -hmm. in American history. Just take a look at the legislation, like the tax bill, red line. As I said, first time in a century that billionaires pay lower tax rates than steel workers. That's the party of labor. Okay. But what they've done since Nixon is understandable. I mean, by the time of Nixon, yeah. the Republicans recognized they are the, I mean, they're both business parties, but they are the party more dedicated to the right to the, to corporate power and the very rich. You can't, approach people and say, vote for me, I'm in favor of smashing you in the face. Uh, doesn't work somehow. So Nixon was the first to really understand that we've got to appeal to people on different grounds. It's the so-called Southern strategy. Right. We can be the racist party. We don't say the word racist, but we follow policies. So it's understood that we're basically a racist party. We can tap the white supremacy that runs deep in American society. Uh, 
the Democrats were supporting civil rights acts, Nixon realized it's open, not a secret, that we can win the Southern Democrats by opposing civil rights. Okay. Uh, you get to the mid-70s, uh, Republican strategist Paul Weirich uh, realized that uh, if the Republicans pretend, uh, stress pretend, to be opposed to abortion, they can win the huge evangelical community and the Northern Catholic vote. They all switched on a dime. Reagan had been one of the big supporters of what we call pro-choice. George H.W. Bush, the same, all became anti-abortion. That's now a you know, kind of a mantra of the party. Mm -hmm. Guns, we're all going to be in favor of guns. Anything about, except the economic issues. Turn to anything else, but not the actual economic issues, the ones we're pushing. And that's worked pretty well. They've been able to develop a kind of a dual constituency. Prime constituency is great wealth, corporate power, the one they work for. Then there's the voting base. Mm -hmm. The voting base is uh, mobilized on so-called cultural issues. Yes, we'll stab you in the back, but you won't notice it because we're in favor of the issues that you like in your, in your traditional practices and so on. Uh, you want to have a Christian nationalist community, okay, we're for that, you know, but uh, how long this scam can go on, I don't know. Trump was a master of it. He was a genius, political genius. He could hold up a sign in one hand saying, I love you, I'm your savior, and the <laughs> other hand, stab you in the back. That's a good trick. And he carried it off brilliantly, you know, owns the party. The rest of the party's terrified of him. They have to go to Mar-a-Lago and shine his shoes, you know. But uh, and uh, it's a, that's one of the reasons why people like, say, Martin Wolf of the Financial Times and others are very concerned about whether the United States is going to move to its, he calls it autocratic, others might call it proto-fascist system, which is the, that kind of thing mobilize the population on something else. Great. Thank you so much, Noam. And uh, apologies to everyone who asked brilliant questions we didn't get to. Um, we will give those on to Noam. Um, thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you to Haymarket and Lannan. Um, Noam, thank you so much again for sharing your wisdom with us tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm.